Sen Group, established in 2002 with many subsidiaries and experience and knowledgeable in the market. Sen Group offers professional services in many fields. Century Land Joystop Up Company, Sen specializes in sales and marketing in real estate projects. Century Real Estate Investment and Development Joystop Up Company, Sen Invest, Real Estate Developers and Core Developers, Century Valuation Joystop Up Company, Sen Value provides access valuation services, Century Travel and Golf Service Joystop Up Company, Sen Golf offers travel and golf services in Vietnam. Founder Nguyen Trung Vu is one of the top 20 influential entrepreneurs in the property market of Vietnam and top 10 best entrepreneurs. Red Star Award in 2017. Vice Chairman of Sen Group, Phan Thanh Hưng is among the leading real estate specialists in Vietnam. He is one of four powerful shops in Shark Tank Vietnam. In about 20 years of development, Sen Group has affirmed its position and role as a professional real estate agency and secondary investor in Vietnam's real estate market. Tens of thousands of real estate products have been successfully brought up to Sen Group. In the coming time, we still consider real estate brokerage and marketing as the core business. Besides, thanks to the strength of real estate brokerage and marketing, we intend to expand our business into real estate investment and development. Sen Group also offers a full range of services for industrial and logistic real estate and commercial real estate products, especially service apartments. Sen Group has been contributing to transparency and internationalization of the real estate market in Vietnam, thereby building a better and happier life. Good morning, everyone. And a warm welcome to our regional seminar series, sponsored by Sand Group on Expert Guide for Foreigners on Buying Apartments in Vietnam. Organized and hosted by Hong Kong Business Association Vietnam and supported by Hong Kong Trade Development Council. This is our largest webinar to date with strong support from the region with over 330 registrations. My name is Winnie Lam. I am the General Secretary of the Hong Kong Business Association and the COO of Collius International in Vietnam here. I'll take you through the program today. I would like to start by thanking our sponsor, Sen Group and their representative speakers, Mr. Pham Tan Hong, Vice Chairman of Sen Group, and Mr. Alan Huang, International Project Manager of Sen Lan. Joining them are guest speakers today, Ms. Dao Win, Managing Partner of the N Legal, and Mr. Haminda Mahal, Country Head of Retail Banking, Standard Chartered Bank. We are also very glad to have Mr. Caleb Lau, General Manager of Hong Kong Land, to help moderate the panel discussion later. It is my honor to be hosting you. Thank you for participating. We have a total of 10 national and regional organizations co-hosting our event today. And it is evidence that Vietnam is hot on their radar for investment. From the region, we have Hong Kong Trade Development Council, Hong Kong Malaysia Business Association, Hong Kong Chamber of Commerce of the Philippines, the Chinese General Chamber of Commerce in Hong Kong, and the Y Elite Association in Hong Kong. And in Vietnam here, welcome Auschem, the Council of Taiwanese Chamber of Commerce of Vietnam, Indian Chamber of Commerce, Malaysia Business Chambers, and Singapore Business Group. Without further delay, today's events have three short presentations and a panel discussion to follow where you can raise questions throughout the webinar. Please use the Q&A function on your toolbar. We will not be receiving any live questions to ensure the smooth transition of the event. 
you have your microphones has been muted as well as your camera has been de disabled for good housekeeping. If you encounter any technical issue, our first suggestions will be to lock out and lock in again. In some places where you have poor internet connections, you may see if it is an alternative to view it on your mobile phone. So we're gonna to start today's event with Ms. Dao Nguyen, uh, who is having a good evening in Las Vegas, actually. She will kick off the presentation today, helping us with the in and outs of buying residential properties in Vietnam as a foreigner. Dao is the managing partner of her own firm, DN Legal, and she advises investors on all aspects of doing business in Vietnam. It's very fitting for us to have Dao here to do the presentations as she was on the original team helping the government to write the first, dates, first sets of real estate laws. So good evening Dao and hope that you are having a glass of champagne to join you there. I'm now handing it over to you to start the presentation. Okay, thank you Winnie. Thank you very much. Um, let me, and good morning everyone. Um, hold on, I'm trying to find my presentation. Uh, sorry, my presentation is not coming up for some reason. It's okay, Dal. So you're yeah. enjoying Las Vegas. Yeah. Can, you wait, can you wait to come back? I'm, I'm upset because I'm losing my 10 minutes as we speak. Um, maybe, oh yeah, here we go. Thank you. Great. Can you put it on the projection mode yeah. so that we can see yeah. it clearly? Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So thank you, Winnie. Um, they say that um, usually they save the best for last, you know, so I'm just the appetizer. I'm really looking forward to the presentations of the other presenters. But um, hopefully in the next 10 minutes, I can share with you um, some of the key points on buying property in Vietnam if you're a foreigner. Um, I, we've prepared, my team and I have prepared a pretty detailed presentation which will be available after the, uh, the webinar. So I think um, you can, you know, I'll, I'll leave out a lot of the details because they'll be, they'll be in the presentation. So what will we cover? Quite a lot. Um, who, what, when, where, why, you know, basically. Um, of buying property in Vietnam. Um, uh, to start, basically there are four classes of quote unquote foreigners that can buy property in Vietnam. Um, the first one is a foreign individual. Um, the second is foreign organization. And um, the only thing I'll highlight uh, about that is that it should, it must be in um, licensed in the non-real estate business. So if you're a foreign company in the real estate business, you cannot buy residential property. Um, spouse, the sp uh, foreign spouse of a Vietnamese um, uh, individual is, can also buy property. And of course, um, overseas Vietnamese, which include Vietnamese citizen um, born, I mean, living overseas, as well as those who don't have uh, Vietnamese citizenship, but have v Vietnamese roots. So those are the four classes of people that can buy property in Vietnam. And um, if, if you, who, like what are the conditions if you're a foreigner? Well, if you look on the left, it's actually pretty easy. As a foreigner, you just need, um, you know, the right to enter Vietnam and a stamp on your passport. So hard to believe, but yes, it's really, really easy to buy property as a foreigner. Um, if you're a foreign company, you have to have a license to do business in Vietnam. So if you're an offshore company without any business in Vietnam, you, can, you also cannot buy property uh, in Vietnam. Um, spouses of, of Vietnamese citizens, same condition as a foreign individual. And uh, overseas Vietnamese, you need a document um, generally from the Department of Justice certifying that you are an overseas Vietnamese and again, a stamp on your passport. So um, surprisingly, if you're a foreigner, you have like the easiest conditions to, to buy property um, in Vietnam. Um, and how to purchase? Well, basically, a foreigner and a foreign company, you can buy only from a project developer. So you can't buy from other Vietnamese. 
and you can also buy from another foreigner who's bought property um, in Vietnam. So generally, it's concentrated to a, a property development project where foreigners can buy. So you can't just like go and and you know buy buy like a property from an individual a Vietnamese individual. Um, you can also receive the property by inheritance or donation if you're lucky from a family member. Um, the the uh, the other point to note also is as a foreign organization, you can only buy a residential property as many as you want, but only for your staff use. So you can't really use it to do you know real estate business. Uh, spouses of Vietnamese individuals same rights, except the only difference is that you hold it on a uh, on a freehold basis, long term basis, whereas foreigners and foreign companies can only own property for fifty years. Um, overseas Vietnamese have a, a bit more special rights in that in addition to what foreigners, the rights of foreigners, they can also buy land and they can also buy from Vietnamese individuals. So um, in that sense, um, there, there are some differences in your right, you know, what, from whom you can buy and your rights. And the types of property that you can buy, basically um, for foreigners, the only thing to note is that you can only buy in, in the um, properties from projects where the, um, the government has sort of designated the projects as you know, not within the national defense or national security area. So if, if a project is in, with, is in that area, you can't buy um, property, even if it's from a, a developer of, a, of a, a development project. And so far, our understanding is that in Hanoi, um, the, the, these areas have been designated, but in Ho Chi Minh, this has not yet happened. So that's the only thing to note. And overseas Vietnamese really have no concern. You can buy anywhere and any kind of property. Uh, how many, sorry, so how many um, real estate property can you buy? There's no limit. Um, ex there's no limit. You can buy as many as you want, but the developers themselves actually have quotas. So in one apartment building, they can only sell 30% of the total number of apartments to foreigners. And in one land landed housing project, they can only sell 10% of the total number um, of landed houses to foreigners. Um, surprisingly here for spouses of Vietnamese citizen and overseas Vietnamese, there's no, there's no limitation. You're not really subject to, to the quota. Um, ownership, uh, as I mentioned, foreign, foreign individuals and companies, you only have the right to, um, well, foreign individuals, you only have the right to own it for 50 years. Um, there's a right to extend for another term. And for foreign company, you're limited to the period of your um, investment certificate. So the, the, the certificate that gives you the right to establish a, the business in Vietnam. And, and um, you can also extend for another period, um, provided that the investment certificate is also equally extended. And um, in this regard, if you're married to a Vietnamese or if you're an overseas Vietnamese, you, you actually are not subject to the 50 year limit. You can own it for what we call freehold, but the legal term is actually long term use. So there's another difference um, in terms of ownership. Um, extension, as I mentioned, um, you, know, you can extend for another additional period of, of 50 years. In terms of um, right to mortgages, this is important because, you know, um, as a foreigner, you want to know, well, can I borrow from a bank to, um, to finance my apartment? Well, legally, yes, but the problem is that um, the law says that it's, it's sort of like the loan cannot exceed your, your, the, the period that you're allowed to stay in Vietnam. So, you know, there's a disconnect between, you know, what the bank can provide. Generally, like the tenor could be from 10 to 20 years. But, um, you know, right now, e even like people who are in Vietnam, you know, doing business, they, they don't have um, the right to be in Vietnam for more than five years. So um, the, the, um, 
visa laws have just changed so certain individuals can actually be in vietnam for 10 years or more but there is indeed a, a disconnect in terms of you know the right to borrow versus the term that you can be in vietnam for um, spouses and overseas Vietnamese actually no no um, restriction. You can you can um, you know borrow from from banks in Vietnam to to finance the um, develop, uh, the property. Um, I would just highlight what the one um, kind of like who can buy. Um, um, there's there is one restriction in terms of Chinese passports. So if you're um, you have Ch you're, you're a Chinese citizen and you have like a passport which we call the nine dash line, which shows like the the lines forming the U shape in the South China Sea, you can't really buy residential property in Vietnam. It's kind of like a political issue. And the reason why you can't buy is because the immigration authority will not affix the, um, the stamp, you know, when you enter Vietnam. So that's the um, kind of um, you know, the, the only restrictions in terms of for foreigners is people with Chinese citizenship, you know, with this kind of passport. Uh, the process for buying residential property is actually, um, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, you have to determine like you know, whether or not you're in the quota and the developer will tell you because they actually have the duty to inform the Department of Construction. Um, and, um, and usually it's the developer who decide whether or not you satisfy the condition as a foreigner to buy. And as, as I mentioned, if, you're, if you have a stamp on your passport, basically you can buy property in Vietnam. Generally, you sign a deposit contract. And then after that, you sign the SPA and the, 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 the seller then inform the Department of Construction and you pay you know, per installment depending on the construction schedule. And finally, um, when the developer gets the land use rights certificate or the title paper, you make the final payment, generally the remaining 5% of the sale price. So the steps are, you know, it's, it's pretty standard. Um, can you sell your residential property? Yes, indeed you can. Um, and you can even sell um, the property before the uh, title paper is issued to you. And this is because in practice, you know, it's, it sometimes takes a long time to, to receive the, the title paper, but the government um, says that, you know, you can, you, you can transfer and as, long as the, and as long as the developer sort of certify it. So uh, this is also pretty common common practice. Um, and, and after the certificate is, uh, after you receive the title, you can also transfer. And the key thing to note here is you can actually, although as a foreigner, your term of use may be limited to 50 years plus another extension, you can actually sell to a Vietnamese and they will, also, they will then have freehold. Or you can sell to another foreigner and, and they will have the right uh, to use the product property for the remaining term of your, of your ownership. Um, in terms of payment, um, it's, it's also pretty, there are some, there are some um, regulations on the total amount that could be collected. Like for example, for a project developed by a local developer, uh, the local developer can only collect, you know, um, not, uh, up to a maximum of 70% of the uh, of the total value of the property if it's a foreign developer the foreign developer can only deposit can only collect more than um, not more than 50% um, and finally the the uh, the developer cannot collect more than 95 95% of the sale price if the land use rights certificate or the title paper is not yet available um, on payment the payment is in Vietnamese dong. So what what uh, what you need to do is open a bank account at a bank in Vietnam. You deposit your U.S. dollars into into that bank account, and then it's converted into um, VND to make the payment. And opening an account um, in Vietnam to make payment is also very useful because it's sort of evidence that you brought the money in Vietnam. So later on, when you sell, you can actually uh, remit the money um, in Vietnam on the basis that you know foreign exchange did come into Vietnam for the purchase of the property. So we highly recommend that you um, 
opened a bank account in Vietnam to make all the payments, including the deposit. On tax, um, there, it's all set out here. Basically, uh, there's a VAT of 10% on purchase price, 10% VAT on rental. Um, if you're the owner, if you're a foreign owner and you want to rent it out, um, uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the owner as being a company, if you're in, a foreign individual renting it out, you have to charge 5% VAT. Um, stamp duty is 0.5% of the purchase price. Um, PIT is also payable, 2% on the sale price for individuals um, and 5% on rental if you're, if you're um, buying it and you're renting it out. And for companies owning um, residential real estate, there is 20% um, uh, corporate income tax on the, um, on the gain when you sell or 20% on the net income rental. I mean, it's all in our presentation, so I won't go into further detail. And then finally, some statistics. According to the Ministry of Construction, there are nearly 800 foreigners owning residential properties. I mean, I kind of don't believe that number. It seems, in my impression is like it's a lot more than 800. And um, Ho Chi Minh is where people sort of concentrate their ownership. It seemed like 70% foreigners own property in Ho Chi Minh. And foreign buyers like to own property in sort of like the, the, um, the central area of, of Ho Chi Minh, meaning District 1, District 3, or District 2. And uh, residential properties, the high-end one, tend to range between um, 5,500 to 6,500 per square meter, which seems quite high to me, but um, apparently it's still lower than in the neighboring countries in Southeast Asia. So uh, here's a quick summary. Um, uh, on that note, I think ends my, my presentation ends and over to you, Winnie. Thank you, Didao. I'm very proud of you to be breezing through your presentation. Um, a, a lot of the participants, <laughs> a lot of the participants has been asking and the presentations will be available to share uh, after uh, the, the event. Um, I, I love to hear the fact that you said it is easiest for foreigners to do it. I'm, I'm, I may just tempt it to, to it, check it out. It's easier than for me. It's easier for you than for me. Okay. <laughs> I won't dare cutting you off, uh, even though you're overrunning, because there are important information there. Um, coming up next, it will be uh, Mr. Alan Huang of Sand Group, who will share with us his thoughts on whether Vietnam real estate presents a good investment opportunity uh, in COVID-19. And if yes, which type and where should we consider investing? Alan is a real estate expert and has been very successful in selling residential and tourism properties to local and international markets, such as Korea, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Singapore, and China with a 100% sold out rate for foreigner quotas. So Alan, if you are ready, I'm handing it over to you. I'm sure our participants can't wait any longer. Cannot hear you, Alan. You're going to turn on your microphone. Uh, All right, you're uh, on. You can hear? Yes, yes, okay. we can hear you now. So good morning, everyone. So uh, let me start my uh, stopwatch first because I only have like 10 minutes, right? <laughs> okay. I'm sharing the screen. Slide. Please put it on projection mode, Alan. That will help us read it clearly. Oops. Uh, can you see the scene? Yeah, it's still not in projection mode. It should be on the bottom right of your screen to enable it. All right, it's coming on. Still not projection mode. If you have a technical guy on your side, it probably can help. You can click slideshow on the top. Slideshow.
Maybe we can start while someone may be able to help you in a little bit. Okay, maybe we can start and uh, someone will help me with the slideshow. Okay, later. all right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, so we are looking for a good investment opportunity right now. So I think the first question, uh, uh, since you joining this event, I think all of you know the answer uh, is definitely a yes. Uh, so I will take a quick uh, summary on the first, uh, for the first question. Uh, so, if you're looking at uh, investment opportunities, there's so many factors uh, to consider. So, the first uh, factors that I want to uh, take a look is the economic indicator. And you can see that uh, comparing in for some other Asia countries, you can see that Vietnam in Q1 uh, have a very good positive uh, GDP growth rate, interest rate, and employment rate compared to other countries. Uh, the second factor that uh, might uh, affect our economy is also the political uh, scheme and the uh, political uh, uh, affect issues in the world affect us. Uh, so uh, in the late uh, 2019, you can see that uh, uh, we have US and uh, China uh, trade war. And uh, recently, uh, China also have uh, raised uh, tax tariff to Australia. And the most recent conflict is between uh, India and uh, China border. Uh, as you know, that India is one of the top uh, population uh, countries in the world with 1.3 billion people. And, and now you're seeing that uh, many of the uh, India uh, start to destroy made in China product. Uh, this is similar to a story in uh, Korea as uh, you don't see so many uh, Japan car or when you go to Japan, you don't see so many Korean car. Uh, and uh, for the next uh, might affect, uh, the next factors that might affect our economy is the uh, FDI. Uh, so uh, for the FDI, the main thing that I want to point out here is is that uh, uh, mainly the FDI coming from uh, South Korea and now Hong Kong and Singapore, and 64% uh, is for manufacturing and processing industry. Uh, in this year, from January to May, uh, this uh, manufacturing and processing sector have increased to 77%. Uh, uh, in fact, there's uh, a lot of uh, factories have uh, moved to Vietnam. Uh, you can see that the largest Samsung mobile factories is in Vietnam. Uh, Japan used to be uh, top three FDI in Vietnam and now uh, in 2019 got replaced by Hong Kong investor. Uh, Korea is our uh, like very our long-term investor. They have been here for a very long time. So uh, if you visit Hanoi, you can see these two landmark is a two tallest building built by Korea. Uh, recently, you can also uh, see that uh, Amazon and Apple John coming to Vietnam uh, and Foxconn expanding their factory, Kamasu and uh, other Japanese uh, also re relocated their factory from China to Vietnam. Another factor uh, that affects us is uh, no move. I think the slide no move again. Okay, so another factor is that uh, the, the uh, tourism. Uh, if you check on uh, last, uh, last year before the pandemic, you can see that Korea uh, fly to Vietnam, like 40 flights per day. Uh, Singapore and Hong Kong so have many flights to Vietnam. Uh, this is like a domestic flights and uh, most traffic come from uh, weekend as they uh, spend time here to play golf. Uh, last year, uh, we are rated as uh, number one uh, golf destination in the world. So besides that, we have a lot of attraction, attractions too. Uh, uh,
Uh, uh, sorry, sorry, guy. So for the next factor is uh, uh, the rental yield that uh, attract uh, investor gonna uh, look at. So comparing with uh, some other Asian countries, you can see that Vietnam uh, got four to seven percent uh, rental yield per year, which is uh, very attractive. So just to sum up, uh, yes, Vietnam real estate is a great investment opportunity uh, as a new hub for manufacturing world. And uh, uh, we have a low cost for investment. 60% uh, of our population is in working age. And uh, we're planning to have a 55 uh, uh, free trade agreement with 55 countries in 2020. So, uh, so from the first uh, picture, uh, when you see the uh, big picture from uh, the macroeconomic, you can see clearly that uh, one of the type uh, of uh, a property might be uh, very uh, interesting, uh, very hot uh, that investor looking for is industrial property. However, uh, in fact, uh, from first half of this year, industrial property, the price had already increased like 30%. So in this topic, we are looking at an alternative uh, opportunity, which is a resi residential property that easy to access to industrial zone and also near to the CBD of the big city. Uh, so let's take a quick look at the Vietnam map. As you can see that uh, uh, Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City is the biggest uh, two cities in uh, Vietnam. And uh, the key point that I want to uh, point out here is the FDI in these two cities. Uh, in Ho Chi Minh City is like 7,200 uh, projects, FDI, and in Hanoi only uh, 4,500 of the projects. So you can see that there are big competition in Ho Chi Minh City. Uh, this leading to uh, a high price, uh, which is Dan Nguyen also said uh, earlier in her slide that uh, Ho Chi Minh City have a higher pricing. So that is, we have a more room uh, for capital gain in Hanoi market. Uh, so let's take a look in Hanoi market. Uh, this is the map of uh, Hanoi. In the center is the CBD. And uh, we can see that in the, uh, the square uh, where they said Kang Nam Landmark Tower. Uh, I think you can see my mouse. So uh, a lot of foreigners uh, have uh, bought apartments in uh, this area. And uh, even like uh, the most, uh, the majority of the customer is come from Korea. Uh, now we see that Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong also started to invest in, in this area. However, in this uh, red uh, line, there is a big land uh, that untouched. And if you see the industrial zone is uh, in the north. Uh, so from this area, uh, we call it Dongang. And it's easier to access to this industrial zone. And actually, you just need to cross the river to the CBD. Uh, so besides looking at the geography, the possible to expand the city to the north, uh, we also have to look at the uh, development, the big development in this area. So the first uh, development I'm going to look at is uh, this BRG group uh, joined with uh, Sumitomo's uh, Japan company in 4.2 billion USD for smart city project, uh, this uh, is 272 hectares. Uh, the next uh, big development in this area uh, is uh, uh, a Sun Group project just uh, next to uh, this smart city. This is 136 hectare Kim Kui amusement park. And uh, the biggest of all uh, is, is this, uh, in, from the map you can see the star here. Uh, actually, just across the river is uh, the CBD. This is uh, from uh, Vinhomes, uh, our biggest developer in Vietnam. This is uh, almost three hectare, 300 hectare project, uh, a mix uh, of uh, residential projects and a national exhibition center in this area. And uh, Vinhomes is uh, famous for uh, choosing good location for development. And from the map, there is a yellow light this is uh, a new uh, Tulian bridge 
expected to complete in 2024, which is four years from now. So uh, looking back that you can see that Vinhome is uh, right under the bridge, a uh, very good strategic location. So besides looking at the big development in this area, uh, one key uh, one key factor is that the infrastructure for Metro Line. Uh, this is the planning uh, for 2030 to 2050 of the Metro Line of uh, Hanoi. And uh, zoom in to this area that we have the three project development just now. Uh, you can see that uh, line number four uh, crossing this uh, project. And uh, right now in this area, we only have two uh, project uh, are avail available for selling Euro Window and uh, Bing Bing Garden, as you can see from the screen. So, looking back at uh, the map, uh, this reminds me of uh, Shanghai like 20 or 25 years ago. Uh, we have uh, east and west of the river, I think, similar to Shanghai, if you know what I mean. Uh, so, one side is uh, for farming zone, and one side is, is a city. And now that farming zone uh, becomes a new financial uh, district. So uh, this is a story from uh, our agency in uh, Hong Kong that uh, they said that uh, like 20 years ago when the first project building in this farming zone in Shanghai, they start at selling only at 1,600 uh, USD per meter, uh, per meter square. And right now they are selling to the market at uh, 16,000 uh, USD per meter square, uh, which is 10 times increase. But uh, what uh, so fantastic about this is not only the capital gain, uh, this is also the for renter you as well. So right now, uh, for three bedrooms in, uh, in this uh, Shanghai financial district, uh, they are renting out at 3,000 USD uh, per month. I, and I did a calculation that uh, it equivalent to 21% of return per year. So this is so fantastic. It's, it's, like, it's like you uh, invest in an Apple company. They also only make 20% per year only. So we have these two uh, beautiful projects that uh, in a strategic location uh, for capital and uh, for rental yield that um, you might expect similar to Shanghai 20 years ago. Uh, so beside this apartment, actually I also uh, bought up one of the landed project uh, for, for your consideration, consideration. As you can see from the map of Hanoi, there is uh, no, no more, more land to build landed uh, properties. So this is the only uh, project that big enough to build the landed property. And uh, this developer alone, uh, is famous for making a landmark uh, property. Uh, from the middle, you can see that JW Marriott is also one of the top 10 uh, hotel architects in Asia. Uh, this hotel is in Hanoi and uh, Donald Trump has stayed stay here during his visit. Uh, and uh, in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, you can see this uh, Bitexco Tower, uh, which now become the landmark of uh, Ho Chi Minh City. So a quick look at the other window that I just mentioned uh, earlier. Uh, just a quick add in the key point here that uh, we recently have uh, signed uh, an uh, MOU with uh, Best Western uh, to be the management of the 31st to 39th floors of River Park Tower. And uh, a quick look at our mixed complex, uh, Bing Bing Garden. Uh, with, uh, we have shop house and uh, apartment in this area too. So uh, that's all for my presentation. Uh, thank you. Uh, pass on the mic to Winnie. Thank you, Alan. It's very comprehensive. Even though I know that we are overrunning, again, I just don't dare cutting you off because it's just so much information. Ji Dao has been very, very busy with the Q&A panel. Uh, during your presentation, I think she already answered more than 10 questions. But now that we know where we can invest on how to do it, uh, let's see uh, what the bank is doing to, to give us some help. Uh, bring us to Mr. Hamender Mahal, Country Head of Retail Banking. Standard Chartered Bank's presentation is on opportunities and risks for foreign investors. Hamander is a business leader with over 20 years of diverse experience. 
in consumer banking, managing multiple functions from sales to product management. And Hamander is currently the Deputy General Manager at Standard Chartered Bank since 2017. Let's see if we can get the control of the presentation back. Yes, so that is that is Hamander. Hamander, are you ready? Amanda, are you there? Okay, hello, I was on mute. Um, okay, if you can turn on your video also so we can see you, that would be great. Ah, there we go, can you see me now? Not yet, but I think you're coming up. I think we can start while we try to find you. As long as your video is on, we will see you. Okay. Um, so first of all, thank you, Vinny and uh, Hong Kong Business Association for inviting us here today. Uh, also, uh, thank you to my video seems to be blocked uh, by yourself. So somebody centrally unblock me from the video. Okay, nevertheless. So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to uh, Ms. Dao and lucky Ms. Dao in uh, Las Vegas. Uh, I think a lot of uh, the stuff that my presentation is going to uh, cover it has already been spoken about uh, either by Dao or by Alan. Uh, and uh, so, I will just uh, save some time in the interest of the panel that we, we are planning to have a little later. Uh, so, the first Part, I just want to endorse uh, endorse Alan's view. Yeah, okay. On the macroeconomics of, of, of Vietnam, uh, as bankers look at the stock market is doing well, we see that companies in Vietnam are relatively lower valued. Their stock is lower valued than other uh, in the region. Uh, we also feel that the economy has... Uh, done very well during the COVID situation and has shown a remarkable recovery, uh, you know, growing uh, a little bit marginally by 0.36% in the second quarter, uh, but still growing, uh, surprisingly growing. As you, as you probably saw this morning, uh, news on Singapore having degrown by 41%. Uh, and therefore, in that context, it seems like really a very good story. Uh, apart from that, uh, we believe that Vietnam is... Uh, politically and socially very stable. It has a strong population of uh, socially upwardly mobile individuals and therefore the demand for property within the urban sectors is, is going to continue for some time to come. Uh, fourth, uh, uh, Alan spoke about relocation of, um, of property of, of uh, sorry, industry from China and to Vietnam. Uh, certainly Vietnam is the key beneficiary uh, of uh, this relocation amongst other countries like Indonesia, etc. But Vietnam is number one on that scale. And uh, therefore, uh, that movement of the industrial investment as well as the people who come to run it, and he spoke about Hanoi, uh, uh, you know, uh, residential property being developed near our industrial zone, uh, is, is the fallout that uh, Vietnam will benefit from. Uh, lastly, we have seen that over the last few years, and we expect that uh, continuing into the next few, uh, the Vietnamese currency is, is, has been quite stable and is likely to be stable given uh, the strong economic performance of Vietnam. However, since we are bankers, we do look at the risk all the time. And therefore, just very quickly, uh, we need to keep in mind the second wave of COVID-19, the possibility of that, uh, even though the government is doing a fantastic job uh, of containing the pandemic and has been very successful, uh, there is always that lingering thought in the mind. Um, there are some sectors in the economy which are still lagging, such as garment manufacturing, uh, tourism, uh, international tourism, which supports a large amount of tourism in the coastal regions, is yet to take off naturally because there are no um, you know, international flights allowed at the moment. Uh, and we expect that that will impact the economy in those areas uh, to uh, some extent. The third one, um, uh, Alan brought it up and I will repeat it again, um, is the US-China trade war and we don't know how that will go. That's a mix of uh, trade and politics. So uh, 
you know we we keep our eyes open whether that will uh, destabilize uh, you know the political environment in the south china sea uh, or will it continue as it is uh, could we go to the next slide please uh, just to repeat some of what alan has said uh, high growth in the residential property especially in the luxury and prime real estate all around vietnam over the last 3 years uh, going up quite significantly uh, he spoke up a very aggressive number of 16000 per square foot as is a more modest number with i guess which is largely an average of properties which is uh, slightly over 6000 uh, dollars per square meter however to uh, you know uh, to highlight to you this still continues to be um, you know priced lower uh, than some of the countries around the region uh, so there is still upside there is uh, there is still upside both from a pricing perspective also driven by uh, the demand being driven by uh, a strong upwardly mobile uh, middle class also the rental returns we see 5 to 8% Alan spoke about a four to six percent. I guess you know uh, after taxes, that's what will come to. Um, and the third thing is uh, the major drive by the government uh, into infrastructure, and uh, you know some of these being metros in both Hanoi and uh, Ho Chi Minh. And we know when a metro comes in, it expands the city uh, because traveling becomes uh, more meaningful. You can you can still do some work rather than having to go on a two wheeler on a long distance in the rain. Uh, there are also multiple projects on highland uh, highways uh, which are which connect the various cities in vietnam and uh, there is a second airport that is coming up in 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 uh, ho chi minh all this we expect will obviously have an impact on the overall uh, economic growth therefore benefiting uh, real estate and, and and people in vietnam can we move to the next slide please um this is just to show you uh, the the resilience of the market uh, we saw you know the impact from uh, covid 19 during april uh, largely due to a reduction in activity uh, both sales activity and there was social distancing so people were not to, allowed to meet each other uh, if you recall the uh, the, the vietnam uh, restrictions were only just there for the large part of april uh, and 23rd of april uh, the government started to relax this Uh, having established uh, uh, quite complete control over over the pandemic uh tet is a period which is in february uh, this was in the end of january this year we usually show, see a reduction in activity and that uh, valley uh, or, or that drop in uh, fx is uh, largely due to that uh we have now seen strong recovery coming into may june uh, of fx flows uh, into property and we are a large participant in this we aid a lot of clients um and i can assure you the number of 800 that uh, dao put up of uh, the government's view on how many investments that have been from international investors is much too low you could easily add another zero there uh, so there is a lot of interest uh, and uh, we we see that the volume has uh, kind of jumped back already to 2018 19 levels on a monthly basis uh can we move to the next slide please so uh i'm almost on my light last slide uh, i just want to quickly highlight to you what uh, would be on the minds of a lot of people who are putting money into vietnam uh you know for for an investment perspective uh dao spoke about uh, the low capital gains tax uh, while there is vat etc when you buying the property but from a forex uh, uh, perspective uh you know before an investor puts in money uh, you should make yourself aware of the uh, forex controls uh, vietnam still has strict capital controls around uh, you know um, currency so it is not a free uh, movement of currency uh, that is allowed uh, however uh, for foreigners investing property uh, the government allows you to take out your investment gains uh, from the sale of that property Uh, provided you show all the documentation that uh, proves that you have uh, those proceeds from that the sale of that particular property so it is very important to keep those documents uh, properly updated and uh, accurate uh, so that when you want to uh, remit your proceeds overseas uh, there isn't any any problem uh, 
as such, you should engage your banker. Uh, you know, uh, they, they, they know how these things work quite well. Uh, and uh, they will be able to help you in opening the right kind of accounts uh, and ensuring that you have the right amount of documentation available to yourself. Uh, on the uh, on the foreign ownership uh, limitation, uh, uh, just previous on the previous slide, just quickly on the previous slide, we already spoke about a thirty percent limit for each uh, project. This is a maximum cap; it is not a minimum cap. So, uh, even if a foreigner buys a property and later there isn't a for demand from foreigners to buy into that property, local Vietnamese can still buy. Uh, this is our understanding. As such, the demand for that property, uh, that set of property will uh, continue to be high. Usually we see that uh, the purchase of mid and, uh, you know, uh, mid and develops, uh, developments are to the local Vietnamese segment and a larger participation by foreigners in the premium and luxury segment, especially the buildings that are built by uh, developers from overseas. This is naturally to be expected uh, given the security that it would lend itself to uh, your knowing a, na a name that operates in Hong Kong or Singapore, both from a quality uh, as well as a governance perspective. <clears throat> uh, further, the government is also proposing to lease uh, to to you know uh, increase this limit of thirty percent, and uh, that's stuff that is in the news. But uh, we'll have to see how that goes. Uh, could we move to the next slide, please? Okay, this is my last slide, and. Uh, I hope you have some time for the panel discussion. Basically, uh, I just want to highlight to you over here that during the COVID-19 uh, breakout and the stoppage of flights from overseas, uh, opening accounts, which is required because the dong can only be traded in, traded in Vietnam. You cannot trade dong in Hong Kong or Singapore. Has to be done in Vietnam. So you need to open the account in Vietnam. And for that, you need to meet your banker face to face. So in the in the current situation where you cannot uh, travel uh, to Vietnam, uh, this is a highly restrictive activity for making and transferring money to buy, buy property. There are just a few banks uh, that can provide you the ability to open accounts uh, while you're still res you know, in Hong Kong rather than uh, you know, having to travel to Vietnam. We are one such bank uh, with the specific approval from the state bank uh, uh, you know, uh, to do this. Um, so, so we have a process a detailed process which allows you to execute a, a bank account opening uh, documentation KYC and uh, uh, you know the related documentation. Uh, lastly, uh, you must assure yourself that the bank that you're going through has good uh, online banking and digital banking facilities which you can operate from a remote overseas location. Uh, you know the third thing is that banks who are operating already in your geography. Uh, would find it easier, uh, you know, and advantages to uh, move money uh, between between countries. Uh, but the online uh, operations and facilities provided by a bank are really important because you can transfer money, you can buy FX online. You don't have to, um, you know, send any documentations, or you don't have to, uh, you know, uh, uh, go through a manual manual channel. You can watch your accounts online. Uh, with that, I will come to the last and most important slide of my presentation, uh, which is to thank you for listening to me. And I hope I've had some value in, uh, in, in your uh, future endeavors to invest into Vietnam. Uh, and I again thank Vinny for uh, having us here uh, so that we could participate in this uh, uh, really important and uh, uh, topical uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Hamander. Uh, definitely, and we need to know that there are mechanisms to do what it is. Um, we are very overrun today, but I think uh, it, we can tell by the questions that we are getting that people are very interested in the topic. Jidao has been very busy. She has answered close to 30 questions during the uh, presentations, and now I think it's time for Caleb to, to wrap it up with us. Um, Caleb, Mr. Caleb Lau, General Manager, Hong Kong Land, he will moderate the follow-up discussion. He has been working in Vietnam since year 2007. Concurrently, he's also the Executive Committee Member in Hong Kong Land's Vietnam Residential Joint Venture Companies. Prior to that, he was the Head Investment and Asset Management in a Singapore-listed company and worked as a civil engineer consultant. 
He has a master's degree in business administration and bachelor's of science degree in civil engineering. Joining our speakers today, uh, Ms. Dow, Ms. Ella, Mr. Allen, Mr. Hamender, is Mr. Phan Tan Hong, vice chairman of San Group. Hong is the shark on the judge of TV show Shark Tank Vietnam, in which he has invested in many startups. He has strong experience in real estate and is successful in the development of both corporate and government entities. Now, Caleb, I, I think that your, your eyes are going crazy with all the questions flying in, but I'm going to hand the control over to you so that you can make our speakers a little bit uncomfortable for, by asking some sharp questions. So, uh, Caleb, I think we'll stick with the original timeline. Um, and my apology to the participants, if you cannot stay for the rest of the session, there will be a recording available for all of you to access later. So, Caleb, it is for you to take this forward. Thank you so much, Winnie. Well, a big thank you to Ms. Dow. I mean, she has made my job much easier by answering all 29 questions really left. Well, I'll start off with um, Hong. Um, just now, Alan did share with us that um, the yield expectation for, for investment in properties. Um, can you share with us what are the expectations for the capital appreciation uh, for the, prop, uh, the resident properties? Uh, is there any particular place that you would recommend that foreign investors would be keen to invest? Okay, thank you. And uh, hello, everybody. Uh, very nice to see you and uh, share with you some information about the investment of pro uh, properties in Vietnam. Uh, at first, I want to tell you that um, uh, for the year, year of the residential property for rent in Vietnam uh, depends on the location, but uh, you can enjoy uh, roughly about 7 to 8 uh, percent in a city home. And uh, if you are invested in uh, like a condo town or the apartment, service apartment in tourism areas like Ha Long or Da Nang or some other areas, you can enjoy higher, maybe 10 to 12% per year. Uh, that is very high year in compared to the other uh, countries like uh, Singapore, Hong Kong or Australia. And, um, but the most important, if you, you, you're looking for the uh, price of the investment in uh, residential properties in Vietnam, now you can compare to uh, in the mainland China 20 years ago, because this is very important for Vietnam, because since Vietnam joining uh, WTO um, uh, since 2006 up to uh, 2018, Vietnam uh, GDP per capita uh, reached 3,000 per capita already. And this is very important that uh, it's the same, exactly the same as in mainland China 20 years ago. And in compared to the Singapore and Hong Kong, 40 or 50 years ago, the price of the investment in uh, residential properties in Vietnam. Now it's a very potential and very cheap price. So that is, a, can answer you the question because uh, in Vietnam you can look at uh, both for the uh, op operation uh, year and uh, looking for the uh, capital gain in the, uh, in the coming time. I expect that in the next 10 years, the uh, properties in Vietnam at least can uh, become triple or uh, five times higher than, than now. If, if you look, look back at the uh, last 10 years in some certain areas like in, in Da Nang or Nha Trang or Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City, it's 10 times higher uh, multiple in capital gain. So in Vietnam, you can both enjoy the yield uh, at least from seven to eight um, to up to uh, 10 and 12% per year for the yield. And at least uh, uh, 10, uh, five to 10 times higher after five years or 10 years uh, later. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Hong. Um, and a follow-up question for you. Of course, um, the property prices have risen uh, over the number of years, uh, the pre-COVID-19. Now that we are in the post-COVID, do you expect the prices continue to go up or there's any going to be uh, adjustments uh, to the prices? that um, this is something that um, for, for our viewers here who are planning to invest, is it the best time to come in? Sure. Actually, uh, you are uh, very difficult to find out any project that uh, they are like uh, directly discounted in, in terms of the price. But they give you a lot of uh, promotion, like uh, give you free uh, interest for next five years, uh, 10 years, uh, sorry, uh, three or five years or give you free on the interior finishing or uh, renovation. 
or give you some uh, interior or uh, uh, home uh, uh, house kitchens or uh, uh, other things that uh, you can you can enjoy. Um, and I, I think that a very good time to come to Vietnam right now because uh, actually it's in Vietnam the uh, price now is a very good moment to invest it in because uh, now is that uh, a new cycle because Vietnam the cycle the property uh, property price in Vietnam is very short normally about only five to eight or ten years only compared to the eight, uh, 15 or 18 years in other countries like in Hong Kong or Singapore. Vietnam, one cycle only five, uh, less than five, uh, uh, five to 10 years only. So now it uh, seems to be that end of the last cycle and going to be in the new uh, cycle in next year, 2021 or 2022. Uh, it will be, we, we can enjoy the benefit already. Thank you, Hong. Well, we get everybody excited to invest. Now, I, why don't you I switch um, to Ms. Dow? Well, you heard all the excite, excitements uh, we should be investing in Vietnam. Um, I know some of the viewers are, are wondering, you know, what are the pitfalls, you know, we should be watching uh, during the process of buying and as well as reselling the properties. Is it difficult or is it cumbersome? What do you think on that? Uh I actually don't think that it's that difficult. The, the, the issue is um, you have to make sure as a foreigner that you're within the, the quota, you know, and some developers, like my, my understanding is like, the, you know, the quotas get exceeded very quickly uh, on the first sale. So I think the challenge for a foreigner is to, to determine, you know, like, am I buying the property from the right person? You know, because sometimes the Vietnamese can also have the, the property that is within the, the, the quota. So I think that it's more kind of like the practical issues. Um, the, the legal side, it's really quite, quite simple, um, very, very easy. And, um, you know, um, I don't think for even foreign exchange is an issue if you open an account and you have clear evidence from the bank, you know, that you remitted um, the money um, into Vietnam. And certainly that if you open a bank account at like Standard Charter, any of the, you know, big branches of the banks that have um, licenses in Vietnam, it's not really um, a, a concern. It's, it's pretty easy in my view. Great, great to hear that. Um... My recommendation, please reach out to Ms. Dow and also your banker, a friendly banker will be Haminda. Well, I'm glad to hear that Standard Charter is really supporting our foreign buyers by opening accounts in their home country. Um, that's great to hear. Um, a lot of yeah, yeah. Yeah. my buyers are asking me that, you know, whether they can do so. Um, glad to uh, hearing from you. So is it very cumbersome to open a bank, Vietnam bank account overseas? Hi, uh, Caleb. No, um, see, the, there are a couple of elements in opening a bank account that a banker needs to uh, uh, get assurance on. Uh, this is required from a regulatory perspective. Uh, number one is uh, the KYC, which is uh, we, we, we need to know our client. And therefore, we need to see government issued uh, documentation, which compares uh, with the identity of the client. We need to establish that. Uh, then there is the signature that needs to be captured on the application form, the account opening application form. And uh, we need to witness that. Uh, we need to know that it's the same person who is uh, signing as is the person who has been identified. And th third is the source of funds. So um, the process that we have uh, got approval from, uh, while we can check out the source of funds uh, through documentation that the client is required to send, uh, we can do the KYC through a video call, uh, but we need somebody to witness the signature. And, uh, you know, we, we, we have put in place a process of doing that uh, through a notary uh, or a lawyer who has notary uh, credit, credentials. Uh, so, you know, in that case, the client needs to go to a notary uh, and have the notary submit those documents directly to Standard Chartered. And we will be able to open the account. Uh, you know, once the account is open, uh, the client can remit money uh, into that account, uh, trade uh, by the, you know, convert into dong and submit uh, to the builder as per the schedule uh, required. So it, it's a, actually a great piece of work that some of my colleagues have done 
in a very short period of time uh, in reaction to the COVID-19 restrictions on international travel. All right, great. Um, now I just want to touch on financing. I mean, of course, uh, we all know where you have shared that the financing is being offered uh, by Standard Charter to foreigners were tied to the uh, residence or visa um, that is uh, given to the foreign buyers. Um, is Standard Charter considering any um, foreign collaterals? I mean, if, if Standard Chartered um, Bank is, is their bankers as well, let's say in Hong Kong or in Singapore or various other places? No, I, I, uh, I, I don't see a big demand from people from overseas for foreign collateral. Uh, I think if uh, there was allowance for people to fund their mortgage within Vietnam, uh, that that would be more more in demand for people who are putting money here. Uh, but at the moment, uh, it, it's largely uh, wealthy people who are, um, you know, putting in money into Vietnam. And we see people buying six penthouses at one go and stuff. So it's not the guy who needs financing that's putting in money here. It, it's it's more an investment uh, investment view. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, so we, we are not looking at collateral overseas uh, to help fund uh, this. And uh, if you're an overseas resident, foreigner, as uh, Ms. Dao put it, uh, you, you cannot avail of funding within uh, within Vietnam. All right. Uh, coming back to Ellen, I know that um, Sand Group has um, overseas office that reach out to foreign buyers. And currently, you guys uh, believe in... in Korea and also in Australia, am I right? And um, you know, can you share a little bit, you know, about um, your experience um, or or what are buyers' expectations um, from from the foreign buyers in overseas? Okay, so actually uh, we have uh, office in uh, this country, but uh, we mainly focus on uh, finding uh, agency partner to working with us. So this is, uh, we, we, we're not dealing uh, like, uh, direct with the clients, but uh, from our experience uh, when uh, uh, dealing with uh, these agencies, uh, companies, uh, we see that uh, um, many of the Hong Kong uh, or China uh, customer, uh, they focus on uh, uh, apartment projects, especially in big city like uh, Ho Chi Minh City and uh, Hanoi, and uh, the the thing that uh, they, they focus on is on the uh, the potential for uh, rental U and capital gain. So the the minimum expectation uh, for these clients uh, is uh, uh, around five percent per year for rental U, and uh, for capital gain, I think uh, this is the story that I share earlier. That, uh, that they see the, the, the history coming back, like Shanghai 20 years ago. So that's why uh, uh, many of the Chinese uh, Hong Kong uh, investors, they, they buy very fast uh, in uh, some of the projects in Hanoi and Ho Chi Minh City. Okay, um, we're running a little bit out of time already. So I will just um, have a question that's posted by Mr. Luke. Um, to probably to Haminda, um, what is the percentage of local paying cash and what is the percentage of borrowers borrowing money from a bank for mortgages? Because just now you, you say that you know very few people borrow. So in case they would borrow, how much would they be borrowing? And uh, is there a limit of borrowing? Um, sorry, uh, Caleb, are you referring to foreigners based overseas or foreigners based in Vietnam? I would, I would take it that this, because foreigners can't really borrow, um, this will be more uh, the local buyers borrowing or uh, what facilities, uh, mortgage facilities being offered. Uh, by okay, for the, for the local buyer, uh, Vietnamese resident in Vietnam, there is uh, no problem. There is a slew of uh, banks who will provide you mortgage. Uh, the you know, loan to value is in the region of 80%. Uh, and it's a pretty straightforward uh, mortgage that probably exists in every country uh, where a new home is launched and uh, the developer themselves will have tie-ups with the banks uh, and most of the developers have large sales teams that will help you do everything you know and it's a very efficient industry 
uh, I must say that the governance around the uh, the real estate industry in Vietnam is very very good. Uh, you know, as uh, Miss Dao and uh, pointed out earlier, it's a pretty easy in and out. Even if you're a foreigner, um, you know the, the registration that you get, the don ray, etc., is is very clear. It's above the board, uh, you know. Uh, so that's that, that that's what it's a fairly efficient market, I would say. All right. Thank you so much uh, to the panel of speakers and for time sharing your insights of buying properties in Vietnam. So Vinny, I'll pass the time back to you for the closing remarks. All right, thank you, Caleb. Uh, my apology to everyone that we are overrunning. Just regarding the uh, Dao was answering over 40 questions on the Q&A panel. We still have some left over in which we will get back to you privately. Um, a, video, a video of this webinar as well as the presentation slides will be available in about 48 hours. And if you are a participant, you will receive it from us. Otherwise, it is accessible on our website. Uh, unfortunately, Mr. Hong of Sand Group has an urgent meeting he has to run to, and Alan was still there. So thank you, Alan, and please send our regards to Mr. Hong for sponsoring and speaking on this webinar. Thank you, Ms. Dow. Thank you, Hamander, for sharing your thoughts with us. And thank you, Caleb, for having control of the interesting conversation and to the participants on behalf of HKBAV and SEND Group, thank you for spending time with us today and hope that you have find the information that you need to make the next big step in being an investor in Vietnam. Now, if there is a topic that you want to hear from HKBAV or any of our expert speakers today, or if you're interested in being featured in one of our future webinars, do reach out to us. Until then, we'll see you again and uh, have a very good day and you know, have a very good evening. Thank you.